Hello and welcome to our March Masterclass webinar with Sixth Sense. Today, we have our industry expert, Graham Brooks, here to give us an inside look into the vulnerability life cycle, how bugs become vulnerabilities, and why you should care. If you have any questions, please add them to the chat, and Graham will reach out after to answer those. And with that, Graham Brooks. Thank you, Joe. I'm actually really excited by this session because we're going to be taking two distinct conversations and kind of mashing them together. On the one hand, we're going to be talking about vulnerabilities and their life cycles. And on the other hand, we're going to be talking about a really specific issue. And in larger context, we're basically describing how curious hackers find vulnerabilities, how those vulnerabilities are eventually weaponized by criminals, and then how security analysts remediate those vulnerabilities. To take you through that experience, we're going to use the famous log4shell vulnerability as our focus point. I chose log4shell because, well, it's famous, um, and we also know exactly when and how the vulnerability was discovered. So it's a useful point of reference for this conversation. Before we get into the details of the log4shell issues, let's first take a step back and examine the larger context of log4shell, or its proper name, CVE 2021-44228, which is a vulnerability affecting the log4j library within Java. Log4j stands for logging for Java. The purpose of this tool is to provide extensive logging functionalities to applications and services running within the Java runtime environment. Log4j collects and manages data through a collection interface called appenders. Log4j has a wide variety of available appenders to collect and interpret different kinds of information. While not a required framework to use Java, Log4j is such a ubiquitous tool that most Java implementations use it as a default for any needed logging. So any issue with Log4j is by default also going to be an issue which affects most things built with Java. And more painfully, there are a lot of things built with Java. So that's the background. But what actually happened? How did IT organizations respond and how should they have responded? Well, on November 24th, 2021, Shen Zhuan, and I'm sorry if I butchered your name, of Alibaba's cloud security team pri privately disclosed a vulnerability he found within the log4j framework. Per his team's research, the vulnerability had existed unnoticed in the framework since 2013. The log4j vulnerability that Shen found was caused by a bug in how the Java naming and directory interface, JNDI, log4j appender allows for lookup of Java objects. The JNDI has many different schemas available to look up objects used by log4j. One of these schemas is the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, LDAP. It's a core function of authentication between services and operating systems used pretty much anywhere interconnected devices exist. The exact bug affecting JNDI has to do with how log4j interprets text strings looked up using the LDAP scheme in JNDI. If a log4j vulnerability is found, it's going to be because of that uh, uh, JNDI interface. So what we need to know is how people were able to take LDAP, parse it through JNDI into log4j all the way back up to that Java application and execute arbitrary code on an end user's device. And essentially, what people did is they found that if you send an LDAP query towards the Java application, JNDI, through its API, would simply interpret whatever you sent to it without any error correction, without any access control, and would just pass it raw 
to log4j to be ran or manipulated, whatever command structure you asked it to. This is a process called remote code execution. Now, here's where it gets crazy. Most Java applications use log4j, including Minecraft. Specifically, all messages sent through Minecraft's chat function are logged using log4j. So a threat actor could send a specially crafted chat message to everyone on the same server as themselves. And every instance of Java running Minecraft in that server would pass the received message over to log4j, which in turn would parse it using the Java naming and directory interface, which in turn would make an unprotected call out to LDAP, which in turn would then be ran by Java. No prompts for permission, no checks to see if the code was safe or approved, arbitrary code execution. And that's exactly what happened. Now, much better than me just explaining it is this surreal segment from the YouTube video by security educator and researcher John Hammond, where he took the time to build out the attack and, uh, and demonstrated it in a virtualized environment. I strongly recommend watching the full video hosted on John's channel, but let's just watch the short 30 second clip together. So I just tested it one more time to ensure that it works, and I wanted to make sure you'd be able to actually visually see the impact, but my face was in the way in the video, so I wanted to drag the camera up. So let me run the exact same command and look carefully. I'll hit enter. And there you can see we saw the connection come through from LDAP, we see the HTTP request, and down at the very, very bottom of this Windows machine, you can see that the calculator application has been started even twice because it made two requests there. And with that, we have proven remote code execution on the victim through Minecraft. We just hacked Minecraft. So that's Minecraft. When Chen first released his notice for the JNDI flaw, he was notifying around that hack shown above for Minecraft. But as we so previously noted, there's a so lot more things than just Minecraft that are affected by JNDI and log4j. Specifically, Apache. Apache is one of the primary functions of the internet. It affects pretty much every website used um, across multiple um, portions of the internet. I think it's a solid 30% of web apps rely on Java as a backend. And so now we have a vulnerability that was first found within Minecraft, but is affecting a large majority of Java-based applications and now is web accessible. So anyone with internet can just check and see someone's using Apache and if they are, whatever behind Apache is available, like a web server is now accessible to anyone who knows how to code just a tiny little bit. So that's a little bit of the background of the log4j vulnerability and a little bit of information around um, the accessibility for hackers to just deploy their exploit. So what's the response of the industry against log4j and how did uh, people organize and, and help fix the issue? Well, around the beginning of December, 2021, the internet started to explode with news about log4j. It was the biggest vulnerability in recent memory, at least since Patea and not Patea. What's worse, the impact was huge. On the 14th of December, Bleeping Computer released an article listing all the major vendors and products that were affected by log4j. The list was massive. Pretty much every big name vendor you can think of was on that list in one way or another. Every major vendor seemed to have some kind of exposure. Now, I'm gonna pause for a moment. In order to continue this story arc, we need to take a brief detour into software engineering principles. Specifically, I wanna walk through the idea of software package dependencies. Most software isn't monolithic. In layman's terms, I'm talking about how it's built. Do you have independent software packages that combine into a single product, or is it all just built uh, within one application? For larger products, it's generally distributed. 
different organizations have built specific plugins and those plugins are then tied into your large application. As you can see here, we have an example of direct dependencies um, and the Java application and in indirect dependencies. Specifically, you can see that one of our direct dependency is marked red. This dependency is known to have a log4j vulnerability and therefore the Java application is vulnerable against that one dependency. Now, what gets messy is when you have indirect dependencies. So a vulnerability affecting something further down the supply chain, which then affects multiple other components of the supply chain. You can see we've got two direct dependencies now that are affected by that indirect dependency, which then all three of those issues feed into your Java application. When you have that indirect dependency issue, it becomes a lot more difficult for your upstream vendors to release patches for that issue and fix them quickly. And that brings us back to why there are a variety of different kinds of responses organizations took to deal with Log4j. When the Log4j vulnerability was first announced, organizations quickly found themselves in one of a couple camps. The first and best camp to be in was the no exposure camp. These organizations performed a hopefully thorough investigation of their external and internal software inventories and found that they didn't use any Java related products at all. In fact, that was a really easy shortcut to figure out the vulnerabilities impact. If you don't use Java, then you're not vulnerable. The second and most common camp was the limited exposure camp. These organizations found that some of their internal and external systems relied on Java. And on further review, a few of those systems used log4j. Next, it's pretty much become a roll of the dice to decide whether those systems were both business critical and also externally facing. In vulnerability risk management, we use a concept known as mitigating factors to triage vulnerabilities based on the risk they pose to the organization, rather than just the CBSS score provided by MITRE and NIST. For example, with Log4j, a company might have an application that is fully exposed to the vulnerability, but the only access to the application is from a terminal in the basement, which is only ever used by facilities and they only ever access that terminal directly, and the device is not network accessible. Because of these mitigating factors, that instance of log4j might never be repaired. It doesn't mean that the system isn't vulnerable to log4j, it just means that the risk is so low because of those mitigating factors that resolving the vulnerability is not a high priority. So for these middle group organizations, Log4j was an exercise in mitigation. What product poses the most risk if, a, if exploited matched up against the list of products which are currently impacted by Log4j? Thankfully, for many of these organizations, the answer was simply to deploy a patch from a reputable vendor quickly and then move forward. Unfortunately, there's also a third camp. That is the extended exposure camp. These were, and still are in some cases, organizations which rely heavily on Java-based applications, and they deploy multiple public-facing business-critical applications compromised by Log4j. Some of these organizations went straight dark. A friend of mine was the security officer for one of these. I honestly didn't hear from him for about a month after the Log4j vulnerability was announced. These kinds of organizations were the hardest hit by Log4j and had to make many choices quickly in order to ensure business continuity. Regardless of whether a company was somewhat exposed to Log4j or extensively exposed, all affected organizations had to go through a process of mitigation and remediation. For a well-managed and disciplined IT security team, this process began with building an inventory of affected systems, products, and services. 
As we've talked about on previous masterclass episodes, the first stage of any effective IT management project is to build out a detailed inventory of projects affecting IT assets. This is doubly important when facing an urgent crisis. It's incredibly normal to want to rush into the process of remediating critical problems, but a misapplied patch can be as destructive to critical services as an exploited vulnerability. So smart IT leaders learn to slow down and focus on information gathering as the first step for resolving massive critical issues like Log4j. Once information was collected, our model security organization would then begin to reach out to vendors, figuring out what upgrade paths existed for their assets. Some vendors would be far more capable than others when providing patches for Log4j. Um, as an example, vendor A might have a simple path to upgrade their products. They don't have any secondary dependencies, they're all primary. Vendor B might need to work with one of those secondary upstream vendors to update their components before they can provide a patch to you. And then vendor C, well, they might not even be in business anymore. Thankfully, for organizations working with vendors like vendor A, the remediation path wasn't very painful. Most of these vendors had patches ready to go within days, sometimes even hours of the announcement of the vulnerability. With the vendor B companies, you might find yourself hanging out for weeks, waiting for the patch to become available. And for organizations dealing with unsupported software, their options were limited to accepting the risk with maybe a customer disclosure, which is definitely not an attractive option. They might mitigate the risk by limiting the use of those affected products, or they might even have to strip out the products altogether. This last item is what caused some organizations to go dark. They had to completely rebuild whole chunks of their business critical offerings. One of the other hard realities of the Log4j story was that not all remediations were made equal. Many of the patches provided by vendors were built without appropriate testing. The urgency was just too great. And when deployed, many of the patches were not fully tested by downstream companies. Outages were rampant, and IT staff billable hours went through the roof. And that was assuming that a patch was going to be released at all. Sometimes they weren't. For some legacy products, the vendor didn't even exist. The solution was to simply turn off the service, regardless of whether it was business critical or not. These drastic measures were not taken in error. Here are some of the ridiculous impact stats for Log4Shell. Over 1 million attacks, many of them being initially successful, were initiated within the first 72 hours of the disclosure. CISA reported approximately 1,500 traditional applications impacted by Log4Shell within one year. And they also reported 2,800 web-based applications also impacted during that same year. More than 50% of the affected applications were flagged as end of life, meaning that they were no longer supported by their vendors, thank vendor C. On average, 22,000 attacks were carried out using Log4Shell on a weekly basis for the first few months. And finally, the research group Checkpoint Global found that about 40% of networks worldwide were affected in some way by Log4Shell. Log4Shell was an absolute race against the clock for many organizations. And unfortunately, it caused a huge disruption to swaths of the business landscape. You know it's bad when a cybersecurity issue is front page news in a non-tech newspaper. Estimating the monetary impact of Log4Shell is pretty much impossible because it was such a wide-reaching vulnerability affecting so many companies. But we can draw some useful conclusions and best practices from the story. The companies hit hardest by Log4Shell were organizations which used legacy products in their frontline customer-facing applications. For these organizations, Log4Shell wasn't just an important threat to data integrity. It was an existential threat to business continuity. These organizations had to make painful choices about what parts of their business to keep running and what parts to just shut down. 
for each major vulnerability that arises, there are many general and sometimes specific lessons to be learned. For log 4 shell, the two most important lessons I took away is the importance of establishing strong vendor partnerships and software usage auditing. Exposure against log 4 shell was completely indiscriminate. It was a roll of the dice. There were companies with strong cybersecurity processes who were just as exposed as companies who had no cybersecurity process. At least that was true for the first 24 hours or so. The difference was in how quickly an organization could pivot and resolve their log four shell vulnerabilities. And that generally came down to two key functions. Did they produce a, a process with their vendors where they would communicate their needs quickly? And did their vendors provide a list of um, like their own concerns, their own needs? If you have a strong relationship with the vendor, you'd be able to have a communication channel in case of an emergency. So strong vendor relationships, critical. And then also, did they effectively understand the products and services that they had deployed in their own environments? Some of them, that's absolutely true. For other organizations, unfortunately, it was a lot worse. The organizations who could provide positive answers to both of those statements, strong vendor relationships and effective software audits, performed significantly better when resolving Log4j compared to those who didn't. They were able to perform their initial impacts quickly, make educated decisions around what risks to remove, mitigate, and even accept. They're able to create roadmaps for remediation, test their remediations, and then deploy those remediations quickly. And they're able to communicate with their vendors effectively around their needs, knowing that their vendors were working just as efficiently to remediate the vulnerable products. Unfortunately, we're probably never going to know the full impact of log 4 shell but we do know that it was a forceful wake up from many organizations that needed to tighten their security policies and introduce better mechanisms for auditing and reporting on legacy and unsupported systems. If you found this webcast helpful or useful, please tune in for the next episode where we're actually gonna show you how you can scan for and then even remediate the log for shell vulnerability using Sixth Sense. Until then, please have a fantastic and safe day.